So uh, this is my uh, this is the title of the book I published about ten years ago, uh, where I studied uh, school books until two thousand and nine. But I will speak about uh, current school books as well. But first, I would like, with your permission, really, to dedicate this webinar to the Palestinian children who were killed this year by the Israeli army. Uh, this picture gives about half of them. And the question that I asked myself when I started this, uh, my, my study was, how do you educate children to kill other children? Or how do the oppressed educate their children? Because the people who kill these children are our children. Our children who at the age of 18 become soldiers and pilots and very quickly murderers. How do you educate children to become these people? that you see here in this photo. Killing a child and then taking photo. And uh, school books are only part of the, of the answer. But I studied school books, I study other things as well, classroom discourse and racism in schools and so on. This, today I will uh, concentrate on the school books. So first let's um, define Israel. Israel publicizes itself as a democracy and the world is very happy to accept it for their own reasons. But the truth is that Israel is an ethnocracy where one ethnic group uh, dominates all other ethnic groups. And uh, Israeli school books are meant to Do you see the whole uh, the whole uh, slide? Because I don't. Yeah, I do. I see it. You see the it's title right. also. Yeah. yeah, I can see everything. Okay, fine. Um, the function of school books is really to give a version of reality, and this is all over the world, that will enable uh, students to live with the past and to. Uh, look for the future in their uh, in their countries and accept what is called the founding crimes of the of the of this uh, of the country. So Israeli school books are meant to legitimate the Zionist project of conquest and settlement to both Jewish Palestinian Arab Jewish and Palestinian Arab students who are of Israeli citizenship. I studied about 30 books of history, geography, and civic studies. And in Israel, um, uh, school books production is, is a private uh, industry, but all the books have to be authorized by the Ministry of Education. And therefore they have the same, they must have the same ideological background based on uh, Zionism. And they must have some basic assumptions which are not given to, to, to discussion. For example, Jewish historical rights on the land, the whole land of Israel and Palestine, anti-Semitism, and value assumptions. What is good and desirable, what is good and desirable is Jewish state, Jewish majority, Israeli control. All this guarantee against another Holocaust. So this is the basic of, of Israeli education. Now, Israeli education never encouraged peace education. There's never been any program of peace education, although the UN gives a lot of money for uh, schools who do that. And uh, not only wasn't encouraged, but it was really uh, prevented. Uh, on the contrary, on the other hand, when you uh, enter Israeli schools, you see all kinds of slogans, love the other, respect differences, and the other is me, which is a huge uh, uh, project of Israeli Minister of Education. And history curriculum has also set as one of the objectives to promote understanding towards others. And the question is, who are these others? So in Israel, there are two groups of others. They are Jewish or non-Arab others, 
who are imported into the state by the government and they are considered others that can be molded and cultivated to suit the ideal of a Jewish Western modern democratic state. Until they are molded and cultivated, they are distanced and marginalized and undergo what we can say symbolic cultural elimination and inner colonialism because they depend completely on the, on the bureaucracy of the state for housing, for jobs, for children, education, everything. I'm talking here about uh, Arab Jews, Jews from Muslim uh, countries who were brought to replace the exterminated Jews of Europe and about Ethiopian Jews uh, who are still uh, brought in, uh, into the country for the same demographic uh, reasons. Uh, the other group is the indigenous Arab Palestinians who are not candidates and never been candidates for integration and assimilation because they are treated as a race namely as a group that never changes. And they undergo symbolic, cultural, and physical elimination. So this is the difference. Here, for example, we see from a geography school book, um, the conception of others. Uh, the title is Jewish versus Arab population. On the upper part, you see Jews and others. You see that? in English. On the lower part, you see Arab population. Now, who are the others if they are not the Arabs? Because the Arabs are called the non-Jewish population, the non-Jewish sector. The others are um, immigrants that are brought, were brought from former Soviet Union and are not Jewish. But since they are white, uh, they are accepted, in our group, okay, against the Arabs. And they are uh, formally uh, um, defined as others in the, in, the, in the register, but the school book doesn't say that. So the children should assume that they are non-Jews who are not Arabs. So they, be, they deserve to belong with us. Now, if you look at the little figurines, that represent the populations. You see that in the group of Jews and others, you have two funny looking uh, people, but there's nothing Jewish about them. They don't have any Jewish object signs. They can be anyone. Whereas for the Arab population, you see the representation by two racist icons of Alibaba with a camel and his crouching wife. And this is the only representation of Arab citizens in this book. Of course, nobody looks like that, citizens or not, but this is the only representation that you have of, uh, of uh, Arab citizens. Uh, by the way, in all the school books of Israel, um, even those that teach you about the Arabs and the Arab culture or whatever, you don't see one photograph of an Arab human being like us, modern, professional, etc. Not even one. There was a, a study last year by an organization called Sikui, and they uh, published it. Now, how do we teach the children to love the other if we only teach them to fear the others? Uh, Foreman chief scientist of, uh, of the Ministry of Education said, we only teach our students that we are victims. So who are the current threatening others? And of what and of whom can we be victims today, according to the textbooks? And this takes us back to the post-Holocaust slogan, never again, because the Arabs, and the Palestinians in particular replaced the European anti-Semites as the potential exterminators of the Jewish people. The revenge that uh, Israeli education is, is, is uh, promoting and inculcating in the students from a very early age by a very 
a traumatizing Holocaust education, the revenge is directed towards the Arab Palestinians. So they are the threatening others. And the discourse of never again is never again for us. And it creates a rhetoric of victimhood on one hand and power on the other hand and justified by the fear of becoming powerless minority again, both physically and culturally, whatever is done to the Palestinians or to the Jewish others in the name of Western culture, because the, the, the cultural fear of Israelis ever since Israel was founded was that we should uh, become a part of the Middle East. So Jews from Muslim countries and Jews from Africa have to be to undergo a civilizing process of re-education so they don't orientalize and Africanize our so-called Western, uh, Western culture, which is not Western at all, but we have no time for that. So we are victims. We inherited victimhood from the Holocaust. We are victims now, we are potential victims because we have potential exterminators and we have to protect ourselves physically and culturally against all these others. Now, um, sociologist uh, Zygmunt Bauman, uh, when he talked about Holocaust and the modernity, analyzes the anti-Semitic uh, propaganda and I took it because I wanted to see if textbooks in Israel do the same thing and they do the same thing, unfortunately. So these are his, uh, his uh, definition. Uh, in Israel, they still believe in what is called social engineering, that you can exclude people, eliminate people, uh, recultural, reculture people and so on and so forth. But how do you convince children of the need to exclude and eliminate others. It takes a very long and deep and thorough uh, process. So first of all, you turn the people into obstruction, okay? When people become obstruction, like a problem or a threat, then he says moral and ethical rules do not interfere with the handling of this category of people. So the Jews were defined as the Jewish problem and in Israeli textbooks, the Palestinians are defined as the Palestinian problem, refugee problem, developmental problem, demographic problem, security threat, and the problems must be solved. So there are no more people, there are problems. This, for example, is from one textbook. It is called the, the, the photograph, the Palestinian problem. You don't see anything Palestinian about it, right? But they say that this is the way they live in the refugees, the refugee camps, but you don't see the people. You never see the people. And this problem is poisonous and it acts by itself independently of human action or cause. Although Israel came victorious out of the survival war that was forced upon her, the Palestinian problem would poison for more gener than a generation the relationship of Israel with the Arab world and with the international community. This is what the, the, the textbook uh, tells you. This is another way to turn them into abstraction. It's an aerial photograph of Jabalia refugee camp. Yesterday, there was a huge fire there and many, many, many people died. I don't know if you know about that, only yesterday. And it's one of the most crowded places on earth. But when you see it like that without people, right? And the caption says, one of the refugee camps in the Gaza region whose inhabitants live in overcrowdedness and poverty, as if nobody is responsible for that. This is a natural uh, situation. Nobody sees these photos, for example. You know that Israel uh, destroyed uh, all, uh, all the infrastructure in Gaza of uh, electricity and water and sewage and everything, and they don't let or hardly let any 
any material to, to reconstruct it. So every winter, this is what Gaza looks like. But this you don't see in textbooks. You see this aerial photograph, which uh, a researcher by the name of Van Leeuwen, who, by the way, studied a Dutch textbook, says it's the angle of the pilot who flies too high to be able to see the people on whom he's dropping the bomb. And this is what is called the objective knowledge that uh, education wants to reproduce. This is another uh, picture where you don't see the people. It's a checkpoint. It's what is called flying checkpoint. One day it's there, one day it's not, but it's empty. It's empty of the people against whom it was erected. You see a few soldiers here drinking coffee. And since it's such an abstraction, you can ask abstraction, abstract um, uh, questions of the children. What is the purpose of the checkpoint? How does it represent our defensive democracy? What is administrative detention? And count one advantage and one disadvantage. It's all in the abstract because nobody sees the people who are really subjugated to these measures. Okay, this is a checkpoint, a regular checkpoint every morning when people go to work. But the textbooks don't show you this, they show you this, right? This is a normal morning. And this is administrative detention. This is administrative detention. This girl was arrested when she left school. She stayed two weeks in prison, in a military prison, because all Palestinian children are uh, tried and, and arrested in, in military courts and prisons. And this is what she looked like when she came back. She didn't see a lawyer. She didn't see a social worker. She didn't see her parents. This is how she came out. This is another uh, very sad uh, case. This child uh, stabbed, didn't kill, but stabbed two, two, two Israelis in a, in, a, in, a, in a settlement. And he was lynched. After he was lynched, he was handcuffed to his bed in the hospital, as you see. He was 12. He was brought to trial to a military court. And today he's a broken man. And all these years from, it's about 10 years, he's been in solitary confinement. Haven't seen his parents or a lawyer or a social worker, nothing. And this is what is meant by administrative detention. Another way to abstract people is not to show them. This is a cover of a school book that is called Living Together in Israel. As you see, there are no Arabs here. In fact, no brown people at all, no Ethiopians, nobody. Okay, everybody's white and happy. And the best way is through maps. This is a map of um, a Palestinian population, Arab population. We don't say Palestinian in Israel, we say Arab. And there is not even one uh, Arab city on the map. Nazareth, Akka, nothing. So the feeling is that they live on us and among us, which is the greatest fear of Israelis. And the whole West Bank is colorless. And in the legend, it says um, an area for which we have no data, the whole West Bank. So probably no people there. And of course, mental maps that tell you that Arab villages do not develop because they're very far from the center and they have remained out of the process of development and it's so difficult to connect them to electricity and water whoever knows anything about israel knows that israel is is so tiny like like uh, i don't know in canadian terms the uh, winnipeg or something okay but these are mental maps nobody really knows the territory we know only the maps and then the third one is if there are such um, a problem, we should fence them off. Okay? Draw boundaries between us and then they must be kept outside our areas. We must preserve the national land and protect it from illegal invasion by non-Jewish population. And this 
non-Jewish population are the citizens of the state. Okay. You have about two more minutes. How much? About two more minutes. But I started at uh, eight, eight, at eight ten. You, you, you can continue. Uh, okay, you we can continue. continue. Like all right, and of course, uh, whatever happens to them. Um, okay, I'll go on. The confinement legitimates the military government and the occupation, of course, because you have to take care of it. And the military government is good for us because it helped Jewish settlement all over the countries and prevented Arab seizure of vacant lands. Of course, vacant lands are the va lands that were taken from them. Um, the fact that we have to be a majority legitimate racist discourse such as the law of citizenship, which does not allow a Palestinian who is a citizen of Israel to marry, or not to marry, to live with his or her uh, partner uh, if the other one is from the territories. So families cannot live together, all right? And if they do live together, of course, they uh, they do it against the law. And although the Supreme Court ruled that this is law, it is unlawful. The schools, the school book tells you human rights are not a recipe for national suicide. All right. And the use of of racist discourse is very important because in order to give a, 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 an image of the colonized as something vile and evil, you have to put some kind of, of a frightening stereotype. Okay, so this is how they are, uh, uh, Palestinian citizens are, and, and you have to say that all these negative qualities are in the blood traditional and object to changes. They are unwilling to give anything but the general good and so on and so forth. And then you, you get used to look at them as a category of people and not as individuals. So these are the stereotypes that we have today in our books. The primitive farmer, you see? The Alibaba with his camel, and this is the caption, the Arabs refuse to live in high buildings and insist on living in land-ridden ones, one-story houses. And as I said before, nobody looks like that in the world. Terrorists. And um, all this legitimates their killing, okay? So today, Today, books do not even speak about Palestinians. They say we have minorities who have minority rights, that's all. But before, up until 2009 or 10, they did mention the massacres that were, that were uh, perpetrated, but they were always legitimated by the consequences to the Jewish nation, for example, the escape of the Arabs in the Dir Yassin massacre solved a terrifying demographic problem, and even a moderate person such as the first president Weizmann spoke about it as a miracle. So too bad they have to die, but it's good for us. The slaughter of innocent Palestinians brought some confidence to the Israelis, restored the morale and dignity to the army, and so on. Um, and the, the claim is that positive outcome for us may condone or overlook any evil done to them. And you always have this wonderful heroic photographs and this uh, poster, for example, that showed the lurking Arab who is waiting for the Jews who come to Israel. And all this, every measure taken against Palestinians protect Israel Jews from another Holocaust. So this demand a Nazification of the Arabs, all right? And in 2020, for the final exam, they had to read a chapter called uh, The Design of Holocaust uh, Remembrance in Israel. And what they said there was that what made Israelis 
identified with Holocaust victims were Palestinian terror attacks. And all these attacks, of course, are depicted as, you know, out of the blue. Nothing preceded them. Nothing can not justify them, but explain them. They just come out of sheer hatred for Jews and they murder us. And that's what makes us able to identify with the victims of Hitler. Hijacking of Air France, for example, to Antebi, where there were even German terrorists and they uh, separated the Jews from the others. It takes you straight to Auschwitz and so on. So I finish. What we see in the books is rhetoric of victimhood and power. Israeli textbooks present Palestinians as both superfluous, vile, lawless barbarians and almighty Nazi predators. And they command the students to forget the other drama, the drama of the victim. The victims have no voice. Nobody knows what happened to the victims. And this uh, creates what is called elite racism, a racism that is uh, inculcated from above, that is being, we are being educated into this racism. Uh, okay, I think I'll finish here and thank you.